From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Henry Kissinger, one of America's great statesmen and Secretary of State, National Security Advisor during some of the most fraught years of the Cold War, dies at age 100. We'll reflect on his legacy and the foreign policy lessons he has for today. Plus, senators continue to negotiate over a compromise on immigration that would be part of the bill for aid with Ukraine and Israel, but could failure jeopardize the entire funding bill? Welcome. I'm Paul Jugo with the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages here on Potomac Watch, and I'm here with my colleagues Mary O'Grady and Bill McGurn. First of all, let's talk about Henry Kissinger. All of us have known Mr. Kissinger over the, the years, uh, dealing with him in his post-career in New York City and uh, occasionally in Washington. Let's listen to the current Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, talk about Kissinger. Secretary Kissinger really set the standard for everyone who followed uh, in, um, in this job. I was very privileged to uh, get his counsel uh, many times, including as recently as uh, about a month ago. Uh, he was extraordinarily generous uh, with his wisdom, with his advice. Few people were better students of history. Even fewer people did more to shape history. That is a common refrain in the few hours since he he died. Um, At age 100, remarkably enough, one of the curiosities of history is that he was fast friends with George Shultz, who uh, also was Secretary of State, and they both lived to be 100. (laughs) It's it's a remarkable fact. Um, Kissinger once said that they had both uh, pledged to speak at each other's funeral uh, or memorial service, and of course, Kissinger got the chance to do that for Shultz who died not long after he was turned 100. And Kissinger, of course, turned 100 earlier this year. But tremendous legacy as Secretary of State, uh, Mary, in office. It's hard to believe only eight years, <laughs> the Nixon and Ford presidencies. It seemed like it was so much longer, but he actually left office in January of 1977. Yes, yet he dealt with some of the most fraud issues of the Cold War, ending the Vietnam War, the great opening to China, the uh, Middle East conflicts in which he negotiated the deals which moved the Russians and the Soviets at the time out of the Middle East for decades until they came back in under Barack Obama. Arms control with the Soviet Union, other things. What struck you about Kissinger? Well, for me, Kissinger, first of all, he was a Cold War icon. And as you say, only eight years, but so much happened in those eight years. I think the thing that made him stand out was that he combined realpolitik. He was very uh, realistic about dealing with our enemies. But on the other hand, he was not naive about who they were. And I think that's what sets him apart from a lot of the uh, diplomats that we have today who seem to believe that if we just treat dictators better, they'll come around and become democratic activist. And um, Kissinger understood what he was dealing with. I mean, maybe that's because of where he came from, his early years spent in Germany during um, the buildup of Hitler. And he could deal with them in ways that created both trust, but also kept the United States, you know, one foot ahead, not falling into some kind of naive world where we thought that they were going to change in our favor. Remarkable personal story, Bill, uh, uh, as Mary suggested, came with his family refugee from Germany in 1938 at age 15. Within uh, a few years, he was with the U.S. Army in Germany with the decline of the Nazis as a private and then intelligence officer. He um, then returned to the United States after the war and was a student first at uh, Harvard and then professor where he wrote highly influential books on nuclear strategy and geopolitical grand strategy. And that brought him to the intention of uh, first Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York and candidate who ran for president unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination. And then ultimately in 1968, Richard Nixon, who became his partner on global affairs. But in many ways, it's a kind of story that could only happen in America. (laughs) And he was appreciative of America his whole life. I kind of think he was a better ex-Secretary of State and advisor than he was Secretary of State National Security Advisor. I think 
during that time, you know, the detente that they were working on with the Soviet Union, with the Soviet Union, you know, resulted after the Carter years, the invasion of uh, Afghanistan and so forth. I don't think it was very fruitful. In fact, detente, the policy was a frequent target of the editorial page. And uh, when Reagan ran 1976, I mean, Kissinger was one of his targets. Now, it says something about both Reagan and Kissinger that they became friendly, you know, over the years, because Kissinger was at heart a patriot. But I think, especially if you read the memoirs at the time, Kissinger didn't know what to make of Reagan when he came up, probably thought he's a little simplistic. On the one hand, you had a very complicated detente plan by someone who really understood the Soviet Union. And the other hand, you had Reagan who said, here's my idea. We win, they lose. And I think we know which one out. But over the years, he provided a lot of advice. When I was uh, at the Bush uh, White House, uh, once in a while, you'd see him come in, never announce, understated, came in talked to the president, gave him his opinion, and it was valued. And a lot of other people did the same because he's very valid. I want to say one other thing on Ukraine. You know, he was always against kind of supporting Ukraine, especially with um, NATO membership. He thought that provoked the Russians. But after they invaded, he said uh, Ukraine has to be a member of NATO in a post-war structure. Now, that says a lot about him because a lot of people would just go on defending the original position, but he changed with circumstances. Let's talk about his legacy in office and some of the issues that he dealt with that are being discussed here now in the wake of his death. You mentioned, Bill, the detente with the Soviet Union and arms control. He struck, of course, the SALT strategic uh, uh, arms deal with the Soviets, the anti-ballistic missile treaty of 1972 as well, which limited use of defensive missiles against nuclear weapons. As you say, the journal uh, opposed those, and often in vociferous fashion. And uh, ultimately, I think we were vindicated by what happened, as you suggest, with the, the failure of those arms agreements to really contain Soviet behavior, uh, including on nuclear arms as they expanded their arsenals. But as I got to know Kissinger and read his books, I mean, I think his interest in that kind of, uh, of deal was related to his search for a world order and stability. And he felt that the Russians and the U.S. had to have marry a, a modus vivendi to help with global stability. And he thought that arms control and detente were a lever for, for doing that. And I also think Part of it was there's a kind of pessimism, a little bit of a pessimism to his realism, which said the Soviet Union actually was stronger uh, than it was economically vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and that uh, democracies may be weaker. Yeah, I think if we were going to criticize the way he approached these problems during that time, we could say that he perhaps put too much emphasis on detente, on this idea of stability. And it was only when Reagan came along and Reagan was, you know, more willing to show the strength of the United States that the combination of those two minds <laughs> worked well together in ending the Cold War. But I think his approach was probably very much uh, influenced by his younger years and this idea that containment was a better option than trying to defeat because he, he wanted to basically avoid a very big war like we had seen in World War II. I very much agree with that. But so much else for which he has criticized, I think, is, is unfair. And I would point Bill in particular to Vietnam. Uh, he and Nixon inherited a very unpopular war. And the choice they had was prosecuting it with uh, even more furor to an uncertain end, or uh, as Kissinger and Nixon decided to do, trying to end the war with honor and hand over the ability to defend itself to South Vietnam and negotiate the terms of our withdrawal, which he did uh, with Lee Duc Tho, the North Vietnamese minister, uh, in striking the deal in January. Finally, they were signed in January of 1973. And Kissinger long argued, and I have tended to agree with him, that uh, that would have worked 
had uh, the U.S. continued to supply South Vietnam with, with arms and support. But in 1975, the U.S. Congress slashed support for the South. And within weeks, North Vietnam made its attack on the South and ended up with the humiliating withdrawal of 1975. And uh, from the, of course, from the, the famous helicopter on the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy. And I tend to agree with Kissinger on that point. And uh, of course, one of the senators who voted to slash the arms for the for South Vietnam was then young Joe Biden. Yeah, Paul, you're absolutely right. I saw a tweet this morning from David Harsani, who said that the left hates Kissinger for all his real accomplishments. And, you know, Kissinger wasn't just criticized for Vietnam. He was called a war criminal and so forth. And as you say, what he was doing is trying to negotiate a peace to get out of there with honor. In the end, we didn't get out of there with honor. We left from an embassy rooftop. But that was not Kissinger's fault. I think everyone understood it was Congress that lost the war in Vietnam. Even after it was not a matter of troops, they kept tightening aid. It was very unpopular with Congress. They weren't going to give Nixon anything. And I think Kissinger negotiated the best he could with the communists on the one side and the other side, congressional Democrats undercutting the administration at all points. It was a real tragedy. And I actually share the belief that the agreement might have held had we given Saigon the sport. But there were a lot of people that didn't seem to want a peace. They wanted communist victory. 